Lowe's fill the laptop trader channel on YouTube. Welcome back to our community. I'm just here to share my experience and give back with the stock investing and trading community one video at a time. Caution, most stock traders lose money. Please protect yourself at all times. Nothing discussed in this video is trading or investing advice. This channel is for information only. Please seek qualified help if you need help with your investing. Well, we're in the last part of the year, going to October 2023. Uh, we got four basic things on this month's agenda. I'm going to review uh, monthly and weekly market charts. I'm going to discuss um, a real quick discussion on bottoming patterns. Um, they have a high failure rate. I'm going to use uh, MJ, which is a marijuana ETF, as an example of that. Then we're going to review some watch list uh, charts, what's hot and what's not. And then second part of the video, it's going to be a more advanced topic of selling cash secured puts and a review of covered call selling on stocks you already own for income. Uh, here's just a quick slide of some channels and some books of interest this month. In case you guys want to read more, learn more. I'm always learning myself, so these these uh, resources have helped me out. Uh, this is just review from last month. Just some quick basic rules to limit your risk up front before you ever get into a trade or an investment. I'll just leave this up here for a few seconds and then we'll move on. We're going to do that with the next four or five charts or pages as these are review every month. Just the way that I kind of over the way I look at the stock market as far as um, stages of price action. Again, this is review again for our returning viewers, different names for the four stages. This is what uh, four stages would look like if there was a reversal from a bottoming uh, trend or a stage four downtrend back to a new uptrend. This is just a basic slide of how you read a um, candlestick or a pricing candle. You guys can look at that. I'll leave that up there for a few seconds. You can pause the video if you need to study that. This is just a quick example that I drew of what a pivot is, pivot high and a pivot low, um, which works best on a daily chart. You get three lower bars to the left or right of the pivot. This is the main buy setup that I look for in an uptrend, a three bar turn or, or a three bar reversal. Let's look at some charts and get our brains working and practice at stock or market ETF selection. If we're going to rely on technical analysis, we need to practice and get good at finding the best chart pattern that matches our overall bias and our trading plan or our strategy. So good luck to you guys. So this is just review. This is a monthly chart of the S&P 500 ETF SPY. Um, we had a down September after a um, where we made a lower high and a lower low versus August and uh, July. So that looks lower on a monthly time frame. This is a weekly chart of the same uh, ETF confirming our bias for Going lower on the monthly and lower on the weekly, that just confirms that most likely prices going forward are going to go lower. That's not a guarantee, but there's definitely some weakness in the market. And then the daily chart shows the same thing with lower highs and then lower lows, making a new low on Wednesday of this week. So we've definitely entered into a new downtrend on the daily time frame so use caution when it comes to um, 
stock selection because there's weakness in the overall market. Uh, NASDAQ is showing a similar picture on the monthly time frame, just a different part of the market. Um, symbol QQQ, again, a down um, August, and then a range expansion bar, red bar in September, showing price um, pressure, downward price pressure. Uh, weekly picture looks about the same. Making a new higher low and a new lower pivot uh, low. Coming down towards the 30 week moving average, which is the green line. So that looks lower in the short term. And the daily also uh, made a new low on Wednesday this last week. So when stuff is in alignment like that, that's generally the, the direction that we would expect the markets to continue. Dow Industrials have basically been flat this year. So again, similar picture in the Dow with a large red bar here in September on the monthly chart. And the weekly price action is confirming that also. And the daily, again, we had a new low in the Dow industrials on Wednesday. So all three major markets look lower right now in the short term. And then in the uh, broader base, Russell 2000, similar picture. Just a big giant sideways trend this year with a week um, September. And then the weekly and the daily are going to look similar to the other charts, right, with a new low on Tuesday of last week for the Russell 2000. Downtrend daily, weekly and monthly there. So all these markets are kind of match right now. So that's why it looks lower. Transportation, similar story. It looked good for, um, I think it was July and August, or June and July looked actually pretty good for transport so then they just uh, sold off and basically gave all those gains back so that's not really a good sign so that gives us our overall market bias for this upcoming month and there's a weekly transportation matching the monthly and the daily transportation showing again a new low on wednesday <clears throat> so here we've got just a cautionary tale on um, stocks or ETFs that have been in a downtrend and have kind of transitioned into like a stage one from stage four. This one has been in you know, stage one for about nine months. And it, it has shown some in the past, it's shown that you know, buyers had stepped up, then it just totally retraced and sold off into stage one. And recently, over here on the weekly chart, we've had three strong weeks of volume and buying pressure. And then these last two weeks in September, the ETF sold off again. So that industry is starting to warm up. I wouldn't say heat up, but I would definitely say showing signs of accumulation in um, marijuana space or the cannabis space, whatever you want to call it. And most of the charts I looked at in that space look very similar to this. Here's a daily chart showing like a breakout and a rally for eight days going up. And then we had kind of that square top. And then it's retraced, you know, about 10 days in a row, give or take. It's retraced about 50% from the bottom. so. If this doesn't turn up in this area, I would, um, it's likely it may retest the lows. And uh, that's just one of the dangers of bottoming patterns. It's okay to be a bottom feeder in the market just as long as you understand that a lot of times these bottoming patterns will fail on that first breakout. So that's just kind of a cautionary tale, bottoming patterns. Here's another one called uh, advisor shares, symbol YOLO. Showing similar uh, volume and price action. 
to uh, MJ on a weekly, weekly chart. Uh, here's another one, Amplify, Seymour Cannabis ETF, symbol CNBS. Again, showing similar price action. One interesting thing about volume is here we had some volume spikes. Nothing happened. It kept sawing off. Then we had this big volume spike. And nothing happened at all. I mean, price just didn't move. And then it went sideways for another, whatever, 12, 15 weeks. Now we have this bump up. So it's an interesting thing about volume where you can see some of those relationships between price and volume. Kind of give you a heads up as to what could be moving up in the future. Here's a stock within those, within the sector, ACB or Aurora Cannabis. Again, similar um, stage one pattern with a spike in volume a few weeks ago. Then I also noticed when I looked through my watch list, I had a couple of insurance stocks that seemed to really be um, showing some aggressive price appreciation. So I, I started digging into that also. And this insurance ETF, symbol KIE, has had a nice year. You know, it's kind of went from the bottom of the range, now it's up at the top of the range. Um, so insurance has actually had a pretty good year. I, this is one that I missed, to be honest with you. But there's still some stocks within this sector that look pretty good. So let's keep going. Here's one that looks good. It's a more expensive stock. It, um, almost $294 a share, but definitely showing some relative strength and um, relative strength to the market also over the same period of time. So that looks higher to me. Um, here's another one, International General Insurance, symbol IGIC, showing some nice appreciation in um, August and September. I don't like the big red bar at the end of the week, but if that was followed up by a large green bar or consolidation in, in the upper, you know, 20% of that bar or whatever, that would be okay. Goosehead Insurance has a nice volume spike and a very slight new uptrend. So that looks higher. Heritage Insurance has a nice looking uptrend with a nice close this week in a, in a weak market. Um, this company I looked up was out of Florida, American Coastal. I liked the chart until this week, until we got that range expansion bar um, this week, which a lot of times signals um, lower prices. Could signal higher prices too, but this is just one that I'm watching. I would not buy that here because of that large bar and the way it closed. Here's the daily chart showing that big sell-off on Thursday and Friday closed towards the uh, bottom half of that large red um, candle. Then we've got um, some other stocks on our list that have um, recently turned up. This is a company called CF Industries. It's like a chemical and agriculture company. You can see the head and shoulders top. They ignited this downtrend. And then since June, it's been in a slight uptrend. We've got some volume indicators showing you know, kind of a lower volume than igniting volume. Again, volume decreasing than igniting volume on this bar. This red bar I highlighted because that looks like a red bar ignored. Where sellers tried to sell it off but were immediately pushed back and buyers stepped in and, and took this higher for the next uh, four weeks. So I like CF here, that looks pretty strong stock. William Sonoma I like with a range expansion breakout on the weekly chart um, this week. Coming out of um, a nice uh, Depending on how you look at it, maybe a eight, four to eight week consolidation right there. So that looks higher to me, William Sonoma. Uber has had a nice year overall. Um, it's had some selling recently, so this could present maybe 
possible buy opportunity in Uber. Um, we'll have, I'd like to wait and see a few more weeks on Uber, but that looks positive overall. Uh, Room Provident Corp, symbol UNM. I don't know this company, but the chart has, um, it's still in an uptrend on the weekly chart. Uh, it's definitely got earnings because it pays a dividend. That's really all I know about it. But the chart itself looks looks decent, not great, but not something that's selling off at the market either. Uh, Intel Corp has had um, a couple bad years. Uh, recently, this year, it has regained some of that price loss. It's not the strongest stock in the sector, even though it used to be a market leader. I think other companies like NVIDIA have taken their place or Apple makes their own chips now or whatever. But this is one that could possibly play catch up, you know, later this year and even next year. So Intel Corp is on my watch list for that reason, similar to Micron. Had a big sell off and then is slowly kind of grind it up. This week we ended with a bottoming tail. Um, if that was reversed, it's a nice green bar this week. I think that would be a consideration. Micron. Gentex Corp has you know, had this consolidation area after it moved up and consolidated for months and then kind of broke up or broke out and was kind of pulled back and was consolidated here. So that looks like that could turn up and go higher. Simple app, app Levin Corp. Um, had a nice move up here, real steady move. Earnings came out, didn't sell off. Had a, again, a real steady move up from the 10 week moving average. Then we had some volume. You know, volume just dried up and then we ignited on earnings. It's went kind of up and sideways ever since. So that looks positive, not necessarily the fastest moving stock, but definitely um, looks like that has room to move higher. Okta in the software space. Overall software looked positive until it didn't. So software had a sell off. And um, I believe Okta is one that actually makes money. But this chart looks like it could go either way. So that's why it's on my watch list. Keep an eye on. Rapid7, similar, you know, it's had some earnings reports that have kind of went either way. Now we've got a real tight range over the last seven, eight weeks. And the volume starting to dry up, so that looks like that, if that was to ignite higher, that could really move higher. Rider system sim symbol R we just had uh, some real nice strength recently. Nice big rounded pattern here with the like it's breakout and then consolidated. We got a red bar ignored, we got a shakeout bar, and now we've got a new high this week in Rider. So that is definitely showing some relative strength to the market there. Mark Forge holding, we've got some volume spikes showing buying pressure, even though it sold off after that. But if that were to turn up, that would of interest to me. So that's a pretty cheap stock. So I don't know that much about that company. Akamai Technologies looks higher. Then we had a consolidation period, volume dried up, and then we had igniting volume with an igniting bar. And then that just looks like a continuation higher. Symbol A K A M. Blue All Capital, I also like a lot. Validating for a long time. We've had real low volume in these three weeks. And then we had some igniting volume. We have red bar ignored. That looks higher over those bars. So there is some resistance to the left, though. When you look at this line on the chart right here at about 14, it may take uh, several weeks to get through 14, but I think if it did, it would continue higher. If it didn't, then it could sell off. So that one could go either way. Corp just made a high the previous week, new high, uh, in a um, 
nice consolidation pattern there higher. We got some oil stocks that looked pretty good. They've just kind of been steadily either moving up or moving sideways. We just had a range expansion bar, a new high this week in Imperial Oil. Chevron looks similar without the um, without the strong week this week, but I would say over those highs could be a buy in Chevron. Marathon just made a new high the week before. And sold off a little bit, so Chevron looks like a nice, still a nice uptrend. Here are some, you know, that was kind of what's hot right now, different industries, different stocks, and here's kind of what's not. And this is the reason why, um, in my opinion, like the Dow and the S&P is so weak right now is these large companies. Not so much technology, but all these other large companies that make up Dow are very weak right now. Here's Hershey's in a very strong downtrend. Kellogg's company, very strong downtrend, just made a new low this week. There is some support to the left here around the $60 area, but the price has broken that support, so it could turn up from here, but it may not. Uh, Johnson Johnson. Johnson Johnson is another one that looked like it was going to have a decent year, but it's basically given back all those gains here in the last six to eight weeks with igniting volume to the downside. So that looks lower. Pfizer, major uh, drug and medical company, looks lower. Downtrend since uh, last year. And just made a new low this week. General Mills making in some new lows, and um, that looks lower. And finally, AT&T, which made a new low about 10, you know, about 10 weeks ago. It did have a nice bottoming tail, green range expansion bar, and price has not tested that low, at least yet. And... Um, I'm kind of looking for a double bottom here in AT&T. It's been one of the more valuable stocks. The um, one of the uh, premier providers of you know, like iPhones and you know, digital communications. So it's a pretty valuable company. So for value hunters, I, I could see this being bought up as far as. Something to look for that has value. Maybe AT&T because it pays dividends. So some of the dividend people may like AT&T. So that's on my list for that reason. So thanks to all my viewers and subscribers. Please comment, share, and subscribe to the Laptop Chair channel on YouTube. I'll see you guys next month. And I'm now going to move into the second part of this video, which is a little more advanced topic. It's going to require... Um, a little more capital to do, but I think it's worthwhile to learn. It's definitely something that I use. So we're going to get into the topic again. I covered a few months back of selling covered calls. This month I'm going to discuss um, selling cash secured puts and or I'm going to give you an example of a put spread that I sold. So just to give you an idea of what can be done for some of these strategies. So there's some guidelines for doing this. You must own at least 100 shares or be willing or would want to own 100 shares of the particular stock um, that you would use this strategy on. So if we're going to use AT&T, then we would look for a price that, would, um, that we'd be willing to own AT&T at. Or if we were selling a covered call, a price we would be real willing to um, sell our shares for. Um, but we must, if we're going to do this, we must be using liquid options with open interest and fairly tight bid and ask spreads in case you need to exit the position. That's very important. And I'm going to show you an example of what to look for on bid ask spreads. 
Um, both strategies will tie up capital for the time selected, which is your option expiration. If you choose an option that's 30 days out, you agree to tie up your shares or capital for that period of time. Now, you can buy back the option early if the position goes against you or if you wish to take an early profit or you wish to exit early. So you're not necessarily stuck if you sold a 30-day option, but it may cost you some money to get out of that position. Or you may even realize a small profit. Um, if you use a stop loss, you can tie that stop loss to the underlying stock price level, or you can tie the stop loss to the option price. I personally prefer to tie my stop loss to the, um, the underlying price of the stock. I use charts to help me determine the areas I wish to buy or sell at. So we'll go over some examples on that. Um, overall market volatility like the VIX index along with individual company volatility is a major factor along with the expiration date and the strike selection in determining the options price. Um, events such as earnings can cause a spike in volatility. So just be aware of that. Um, there's, again, when it comes to option pricing, there are five main factors in the formula called the Greeks. Um, they're called delta, which is um, related to the underlying price, gamma, which is related to the how fast a delta can change. Um, then there's theta, which is related to time. Vega is related to the volatility. And rho is related to interest rates, which in general, the way I've learned, rho doesn't matter that much, but it may matter right now with higher interest rates. Um, strike price is the option price which you wish to buy or sell at. So we'll take a look at some graphs for that. I'm not going to get too deep into... Um, using the Greeks, as far as the way I buy and sell options, they do matter, and they're good to learn. Um, but let's continue on so we can keep this video somewhat short. Um, the bid and ask spread and the last price are the three main prices you'll see on the option table. Um, when you're looking at that, you actually sell the bid and you buy the ask or somewhere in between the two. So you'll, I'll show you the spread on that and how that looks. Each stock has its own implied volatility based on previous price movements up or down. Uh, how big you know, were the price candles or bars? And what is the average day's range in price or volatility? So some stocks have a pretty big range like you know, Tesla or more expensive stocks may have a bigger price range than others. So that's going to affect the options pricing. Um, call and put options are directly opposite each other as far as the tables go. As the price of the stock moves up, the value of the call options move up and the value of the put options move down. As the price of a stock of the call options move down and the value of the put options move up. So traditionally um, options are used as insurance. So if you owned you know 100 shares, 200 shares of a stock, you could sell um, or buy put you know put options <clears throat> to protect yourself to the downside. And if you were worried about something going higher you could buy or sell options to protect you on the upside. So that's kind of how options came to be. So this is just a quick graph that I drew showing what the term at the money means, or ATM in the middle right here. So if we picked any stock in the market that had options and we said, okay, this stock closed today at $50. That would be at the money, that would be the at the money price. It would be the same price as the stock price. On the left would be calls, 
and on the right of this would be puts. So as you can see, when we look at the strike prices of the calls, as the strike price goes down, that is more in the money. It is going to cost more for calls. And as we look up on price for calls, that is out of the money because the stock price isn't up there yet. And it's reversed for the puts. In the money puts are higher in price. Out of the money puts are lower in price. This price has not moved down to that level yet. So that's all I'm trying to show you guys there of what, what is an at the money option, what is an out of the money option, or an in the money option. That can be confusing sometimes. So here I just want to show you quickly um, an example of Zoom video communication, symbol ZM. It's a weekly chart, and we can see that Zoom on the left side was in a stage four downtrend and then has went into the stage one sideways trend since last year in June, so over a year in this um, just flat stage two. So we can see there's weekly support and a void below the you know 69 area for sure, probably even below 65, okay? But there's also a void above. And we also don't know if or when Zoom is going to return to an uptrend stage two. So one reason I wanted to bring this idea up to you guys this month is with this weak market, how can you make money on stocks that don't pay dividends? Or what can you do to create some income or, or try to keep your account value growing? Well, one thing you can do is if you like Zoom and you already own 100 shares, you could be selling weekly or monthly covered calls over of the current price and for sure over the price that you paid for Zoom. So right now, you could easily sell either a 70 or maybe a 75 covered call against shares you own, as long as you own 100 shares or more. And you could collect some premium while waiting for the stock to hopefully return to an uptrend. If you don't own Zoom, or if you wish to own more shares of Zoom, you could do the opposite. You could sell a cash secured put. And you could do that anywhere below the closing price on Friday of 69.94. So maybe you could sell like a 65 cash secured put or a 60 cash secured put Maybe go out a month or two and see if you can collect some income for doing so instead of using a limit order, a buy limit order, and actually putting some money in your pocket. And then if it did get down to, let's say, 65 or 60 over the next couple months, and you were willing to own it at that price, you would actually get a lower price because you collected premium for um, doing so. So that's one way you can use uh, covered calls and cash secured puts on these stocks that went flat or that are in a range. Okay. Now here's a daily chart showing uh, basically resistance and support areas on a chart. It's pretty clear to see with these pivots exactly where those uh, support and resistance areas are. So if I had owned 100 shares of Zoom or 200 shares of Zoom, um, after the gap up here and close higher Friday, you know, I may be looking to sell a 75 or a 76 covered call and collect income, um, expecting price to maybe get up there, but also maybe expecting it to sell off again. And if it did close above there after expiration, yes, you would relinquish your shares, but you'd get paid for doing so. And if I was going to do a cash secured put strategy, well, I would go underneath here, maybe under 65, let's say 63, or under the 65 area. Because we had this pullback, had a big red bar, on not a lot of volume, and then we had a reversal bar on Thursday, and then we had a gap up and close up higher Friday. So 
there was pretty good premium under um, that area on Friday. And I'll show you a trade that I did just to prove the point. So that's kind of how you can use charts to help you um, come up with a strategy on stocks like Zoom that are on this big, fat, sideways trend on a weekly and daily time frame. Hope that makes sense to you guys. Um, this is just a more um, detailed view of a three-month daily chart showing um, support and resistance, where we could sell calls, and or where we could sell puts or cash secure puts to create, try to create some income in this market. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of just a basic overview of Zoom, some basic facts, you know, how much earnings per share they have, how many shares outstanding, their annual income, stuff like that. Next earnings date of November. So if I was going to do this strategy, I would not buy or sell an option after, you know, November 19th. But up to that point, I would consider selling an option. You just really want to be very careful around earnings dates, especially in this market with gaps up and gaps down. So we're looking to create income up to November 20th. So that gives us a little bit of time, right? Probably over a month and 20 days. So about 50 days out. We could go without getting caught with some sort of earnings surprise. Uh, this also shows what the implied volatility is right now of Zoom, it, over 37%. Historically, volatility, it's had about 25.5%. Um, it's had a very high volatility back in 2022. It's had relatively low volatility this year. Um, it's got good open interest in the stock and it has good volume in the stock. So this is in the thousands and even hundreds of thousands of interest in Zoom. So that shows good um, liquidity in, in the options there. And then we can verify that liquidity but liquidity by looking at an options table. So Again, closing price Friday, 69.94, almost 70 bucks. I'm looking right now at the option that's the monthly option. It's 20 days away, expires on October 20th this year. And on the left side of this graph or this table are the call options. And on the right side of this table are the put options. Again, you'll see three prices on these tables, you'll have a last price, which is the last price of the day or the week. And then you have the bid and ask price, okay? So in this example, the call option at $70, which is at the money, had a bid ask spread of 246 to 255, and it closed the day at 267. So, which means people were basically paying more willing to pay more for that option. And you can see the open interest on this table is very high at that strike. So there's 4,250 contracts of open interest that day, which is a pretty high number. And again, it shows the implied volatility, not only of Zoom in general, but the actual contracts. So you can see the implied volatility, the IV it changes per contract too. There's a lot to look at in these um, tables. And again, I just highlighted here what is an in the money option, what's an out of the money option. Um, this particular option has a nine cent spread. If we go more in the money, we had a 20 cent spread at the 65 strike on the calls, on the 65 calls. So a little bit wider bid ask spread. We even had an even higher uh, last price on that contract at 626. So somebody was willing to pay 6.26 on a bid at spread of 575 to 595. So that shows there's a high demand right now for the calls in Zoom, which is one of the reasons I chose to go the opposite direction and sell a put this week. So over here, these spreads are tighter. Here we have a 20 cent spread 
on the puts, we only had a five cent spread on the 65 puts. And on the 70 puts, we had a seven cent spread. So it only cost me, that's essentially your cost of doing business in the market, that spread. And when you put in a bid for one of these contracts, you generally want to put something in the middle in between the bid and ask spread. So you can see this contract closed the day at 2.35, just above that bid price. So that would be, in my opinion, that would be a fair price. Whereas over here, these calls are getting uh, overbid, in my opinion. But again, on the puts, the out of the money puts are going down in price and in the money puts are up. So that's opposite of the calls. That's all I'm showing you here with this out of the money and the in the money uh, notes on this table. So any questions on that table, email me. Or if you have any questions, get a hold of me. And uh, that just shows that Zoom has liquid options, fairly liquid options, okay? Even down here at this 60 strike, we've got a two cent bid ask spread. Here we've got um, on the calls a uh, 25 cent spread. So the calls are definitely showing um, that they're more valuable at this time. So again, I'll show you the, the put that I sold this week based on the chart and on this table. So on Friday, September 29th, I sold a put spread on Zoom. So this is a little bit different than just a cash secured um, put. So on this chart, if we look at the 65s, we'll just use the last price of 71 cents, which is the credit I would receive if I just did a, a naked or a cash secured put at 65, at the 65 strike. Essentially, I'm agreeing by October 20th in 20 days to buy 100 shares of Zoom for $65 per share minus my credit. So my real cost would be uh, $64.29 per share. Now the credit is yours to keep if you let the contract go to expiration or if you choose to buy back the contract at a lower price, you'd keep the difference. So in agreeing to buy Zoom at 65, I would be obligated to do so. What I did was I sold the 60 strike put to lower my risk between 65 and 60. So now instead of a $6,500 risk, I only have a $500 risk minus my credit. So I sold at, um, I believe it was 71 minus the 19. So that's how this math is going to work out. Where I sold to open a 65 contract and I bought 60 contract. I would still be obligated to buy the shares if I was assigned the shares below. If the if the share price of Zoom went below 65 by expiration, I could still be assigned those shares. But because I bought the 60 contract, that limits my risk to um, anything below 60. Anyway, this gave me a net credit of 67 cents per share or $67 credit because options are times 100. So that's kind of how that worked out. Again, if I just did the straight 65s, I would have received 71 cents credit. So a little more money, but with a lot more risk. So after what we just learned, you know, a little homework for you guys would be a look at the chart of Zoom and figure out if that makes sense to you and then why did I do this trade? Well, I kind of explained why I did it based on, you know, this chart with resistance and support, um, you know, this down, this sell-off over the last several weeks, and we had this red bar ignored. We had a gap up Friday and a close higher Friday. Signaling to me that I think price is going to go back up and test this 75 or 76 area. So that's that's the way I looked at it, and it had good premium. So my my risk on this is between 65 and 60, or 
five points minus the credit. So my risk on this is about 500 bucks. And I received uh, 67 for taking a $500 risk. So I felt that was worth the risk. And for 20 days, I felt that was worth the risk. And then, and I can even give you the, uh, the percentage on that. I'm not going to, but you guys can figure that out for yourself. Um, but again, maybe do some homework on Zoom and see if that makes sense to you. Thanks again for watching, liking, sharing, and subscribing. Drive safe. Again, you can find me at Phil at Laptop Trader on YouTube. Bye now.